We, <clears throat> good morning, uh, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we have about 69, 70 participants already joining. Um, so I think uh, we can start now. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Bruno Gerard, Sustainable Intensification Program Director, who will give an uh, introduction to this seminar. Dr. Uh, thanks, Is thanks, Isabel. Uh, not for long anymore. I mean, as many of you know, I, I, will, I will leave CIMIT at the end of the month. So that's one of my last seminars uh, uh, in the CIMIT series. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here to, today uh, for, for different reasons. I think it's just to recognize the, the work of, uh, of our program, our team. The work of CIMIT in general, uh, and uh, I think it's a very hot topic still, uh, the, the response and resilience of agri-food systems to COVID-19. In this specific seminar, we'll, uh, we'll focus on, on uh, South Asia. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's interesting because it didn't take long to scientists in, uh, in, uh, in our program um, to ask, critical research questions linked to a brutal uh, shock uh, to not only to agriculture, but to the world. And um, the chance is that our research approach have been you know, built on systems research, on uh, developing um, tools, methods at different level and scales. And with new research questions, I think things to research that has, was done in the past uh, could really, really be used uh, to answer new uh, new questions related to the the impact of COVID in uh, on farming systems, on agri food systems in in general. So, I hope that you will enjoy the the presentation today by ML and and Tim. I will not spend a lot of time because I'd rather listen to them than uh, reading their bios. But they have very impressive bios. Both by ML is based in uh, in India. is one of the three strategic leader for the region for 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 Asia in um, in in the program. Um, and ML has worked quite a lot on, on different topics uh, and is, well, yes, I would say ML has green fingers. He's a real agronomist. So it's not only somebody talking about uh, cropping systems, but he has a very hands-on experience uh, in, in uh, different um, uh, farming systems in South Asia, but was also quite involved in uh, the wheat CRP in, in uh, North Africa, for example. Um, Tim is based in, in Bangladesh. Uh, Tim is also an excellent systems uh, agronomist. Um, is on top of being uh, a scientist in the system intensification program is also uh, for a bit more than a year, I think, uh, Tim, right now. Um, uh, CCR, uh, the country, uh, country rep of uh, CIMIT in the Bangladesh office. Um, Tim is also involved in quite a few projects uh, and has published quite a lot. Both ML and, and, and Tim are very productive uh, scientists because on top of developing uh, proposals, implementing projects, they are also very active in documenting through uh, peer review publications the work uh, they are doing with the team in, in South Asia. Uh, for this specific seminar, um, I think I... Santiago Lopez uh, Ridora is acknowledged. Santiago has done similar work for Latin America and Santiago recently led uh, a paper on the impact uh, of COVID-19 on farming systems in Latin America, uh, which is, I, I believe, the same uh, in the same special issue of, of ag systems than the South Asia paper is. Uh, last person I would like to acknowledge is our colleague Balvinder Singh, uh, who has also been leading a very interesting paper uh, that was, you know, released almost a year ago on the impact of um, on of uh, uh, COVID on, on labor and productivity. Uh, also a very interesting paper. So I would like to thank um, all of you for being at the seminar and a special thank, of course, to my colleagues, uh, ML, Tim, and Santiago and, and, and Balvinder. So ML and Tim, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bruno, for uh, your uh, kind words. And uh, thanks to uh, Ram and team for uh, providing this opportunity to share some of uh, you know, the insights on, uh, on the resilience of, and response of the Asian agri-food systems to COVID. Uh, so as you indicated, uh, Tim and I, you know, together will make the presentation with uh, uh, support uh, and contributions from uh, Santiago and uh, Balvinder. Uh, I would start with, uh, you know, this year's, uh, you know, UN Food System Summit, I think, uh, which is something very, very important. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, transforming the food systems would essentially ensure the healthy food for all the people because those are the uh, the targets uh, we need to achieve uh, healing and protection to the environment respect and protection for the animals safe and equitable employment for the food system workers and vibrant economies without intensifying the crisis of the global climate change so those are the targets and i think uh, when we talk about the united nations food system summit uh, that basically aims, you know, around these, you know, in, in addition to others, uh, to track the progress towards the sustainable development goals and uh, develop action plans for the future, and that includes uh, the impacts, uh, uh, you know, related to, you know, COVID. Uh, so um, I would start with some of the challenges, and I feel like the the, the foremost challenge before all of us is. Uh, the smallholder farmers. I think uh, if you see, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, global map, the regions where CIMID has been working, the farmers are either very small or small. And you can see all the three continents, which is a which is a challenge. But at the same time, these farmers in Asia, you know, uh, they are you know 450 million smallholder farmers that supports the bulk of the food supplies and uh, produce up to 80% uh, you know, uh, food, which supported 2 billion you know, livelihoods in the Asian countries. So I think uh, you know, that signifies the, uh, the, the importance of uh, the smallholder farmers. Now, if you talk about the next challenge, which is the labor, and that's what uh, we are going to share some, you know, some insights on what happened in the era of the COVID, but this paper, came you know, just recently in May from Bruno Dorin, uh, you know, uh, comparing the, the labor productivity and also the land productivity in different regions. And you can see that uh, in Asia, of course, uh, the, with the green revolution, the gap in the agricultural yield with the developed world has been closed, almost you know, you know, brought down. But uh, the gap in farm labor productivity has greatly widened, and that's one of the major challenges: uh, how to improve the labor productivity in this region. On top of it, again, a paper came out uh, in April uh, this year in Nature Climate Change, which uh, you know clearly tells that uh, the human-induced uh, climate change uh, uh, has a lot of effect on the agricultural productivity growth in in, in different regions of the world. And uh, you know this, uh, the the anthropogenic climate change has reduced the global agricultural total food uh, total factor productivity by about 21 percent since 1961, which is which is significant. And you can see that varies in different regions. And you know, in in Asia, it's it's almost similar. But if you go to the Africa, it's uh, more than 30 percent. So that's that's a significant decline because of of the climate change. Also, the climate change is not only impacting the productivity, but also impacting uh, the, the disease, the mental or the occupational health of the smallholder farmers. And with all those increases, and this is one example on how temperature increases are leading to the impact on the, on the, on the communicable diseases or non-communicable diseases and mental health and occupational health of the smallholder farmers. So if the health of the smallholder farmers is, is impacted, that, that have negative impact on the three key sustainable development goals, which is uh, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being. And uh, there's a reverse you know, flow in terms of the climate action. 
And uh, if you see the overall uh, impact, I think uh, if uh, health of the smallholder farmers is impacted, that's going to impact all the 17 sustainable development goals. Now, if you see the, the, the disease spread map over the past 15 years, and we can see again, there's a lot of uh, infection of those diseases in the regions of our priority, CIMIT's priority, uh, where we are working in, in different regions, uh, which came out just recently, one of the paper. Uh, I don't know what this, so uh, now, you know, all those things culminate into, you know, the COVID-19 and uh, that's, a, that's a challenge on top of other challenges what I, uh, you know, described. So, so the, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, become one of the, the most pressing challenges for humanity and has been affecting the health and economies across the world. We all know about it. And if you can see, you know, the International Monetary Fund projections, this led to uh, the negative, uh, you know, GDP growth across the world by 5%, you know, in advanced countries, more negative by 8% in emerging economies and market uh, countries, 3%. But overall, that led to accumulative global GDP loss of nearly $12.5 trillion, which is significant. And uh, the, the pandemic is uh, affecting you know, all aspects of human lives and livelihoods, including the food, uh, where we are interested on. Uh, and there is a nexus between the agri-food systems and the spread of the emergent infectious diseases. There are a lot of literature around, around this, and that includes the, the COVID. Uh, the farmers currently face uh, a, a double crisis. Uh, the climate change they have been facing but on top of that, uh, you know, they are facing the crisis because of the COVID pandemic, there are market disruptions and labor availability, all those things which we will share, you know, um, in based on our, our analysis. So the key uh, to protecting our uh, food supplies lies in protecting our farmers. I think that's where the crux is. So with this, uh, I, I move to the next slide and, uh, and request team uh, to take uh, the presentation forward. Tim. Thanks, ML. Could you double click, please? There should be more on that screen. So um, basically, yeah, for some reason, go ahead and click through them all. Thank you. Um, I, I think as Bruno pointed out, um, a number of our colleagues in our program and otherwise started looking at these issues very, you know, soon after um, the pandemic struck. Uh, our colleague Frederick Badron, I'm not sure if he's on the call, um, published a, an interesting paper about what agronomists should do to um, confront the COVID-19 crisis, um, starting to look at interactions between uh, livestock and zoonosis and uh, the implications for farming systems. I think we can go to the next slide, as that seems to not be loading. But the key thing that we want to talk about, and if you could double click through all the openings, ML, is a, a large research effort that, that came out. And again, Bruno mentioned this, and Santiago was involved uh, with, with doing the paper for Latin America, but there's been a special issue of agricultural systems that uh, will be coming out very soon, where we looked at studies of the implications of the first wave of the pandemic across um, different global regions. And this was a very, very big effort. It was led by John Dixon, who uh, is previously from CIMIT. Um, and uh, as you can see, we also have a range of colleagues that are contributing from, from CIMIT as co-authors in, in this research effort. And what we looked at was the whole of, of uh, South Asia and mainland Asia as well to try to understand the implications of COVID. Um, so it was a four team of 45 people, six from, um, from, from CIMIT more broadly. Go ahead. Yes, thanks. And so what the research tried to do was understand the implications of COVID-19 in agricultural and food systems at a range of different scales, looking at issues related to movement restrictions, market disruptions, implications for livelihoods, policies, 
and how they might affect the, the SGDs, and more importantly as well, rural and food security. And this was done by working with a large number of key informants, um, and we focused on four major farming and food systems. And those are some of the key systems that you see that span this entire area. And this was really what we focused on. Um, and uh, we'll go into some detail about those systems in particular, but we wanted to understand a bit from a productivity standpoint, what the interactions were between these major farming systems and the COVID crisis and their consequences um, in terms of output markets and input markets and so on. Next slide. So in order to do that, um, again, we were looking at an area of where we have over 2 billion livelihoods. Um, two thirds of these livelihoods are generated by farm families. One third is associated by uh, and created by the associated value chains that are associated with, with these farming systems. And what we looked at particularly were four systems. The first one um, going from the bottom up uh, is the irrigated um, rice-based farming system that is mainly rice, includes other cereals and pulses, oil crops, and also vegetables. Some fruit trees and livestock may be involved but it's found in all five of the Asian subregions, and particularly in deltas, coastal areas, and some of the major irrigation schemes in inland plains. We also looked at irrigated wheat-based farming systems where wheat is the major feature, but it also includes very often pulses, oil crops, cotton, and vegetables, um, and particular uh, in, includes a fair amount of perishables, which is an important point I'll return to, including the production of vegetables and milk. The third system that we looked at was the, the hill mixed farming systems. And these are located typically in low to high altitude hills and mountainous areas, in particular the, the Himalayan ranges and also the mountainous areas in Southeast Asia. And in these locations, at least in Southeast Asia, you may have some slash and burn agriculture. And in the Himalayas, you have much more orientation towards um, the production of cereals, pulses, oil crops, vegetables, some limited uh, fruit production and livestock. These systems are predominantly rain fed and um, less intensive than the, the last two I was just discussing. And then finally, we looked at um, dryland mix systems, which occur in the region's tropical and subtropical and semi-arid areas where we have low population densities typically, um, and you find rain-fed crops, a large predominance of the importance of livestock and the integration of agroforestry systems with extensive range. And this might be interspersed with small-scale irrigated grain and forage cropping systems, niches. Many of these systems came out of work that John Dixon had done over a number of years looking at the global distribution of different farming systems and we examined them in more detail. Next slide. ML. Could we have the next slide? Yeah, yeah, I moved the slide. It's not coming. Hmm. Well, while ML is wrangling the slide, let me get into the, the topic. We may need to restart. Um, but what we did was uh, we did a systematic- slide, uh, now, Tim? Yes, thank you, ML. We did a systematic survey of more than 2,500 key informants across the region. And you can see the distribution of the type of respondents that we got from doing this survey, which was conducted in June, July, and August of last year. And we included um, China, Japan, Mongolia, South Korea, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Myanmar, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Lanka Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and finally also Iran. So we, we did a, a, a large sweep of um, contacting with partners to understand what, what occurred with, with COVID and these, these, these farming systems and their distribution across these regions. And this was done by using three 
questionnaires that we distributed and got feedback from. Um, and that included a mix of qualitative information, but also uh, information uh, using Likert scales on the implications of the COVID crisis um, from, from this kind of uh, mix of key informants that you see here. Next slide. So I'm going to rapidly take you through the, the results, um, which are a bit, bit much to swallow because when you're essentially dealing with one of the largest global regions uh, and, 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 and um, systems such as these, you have a lot of results and they can be quite um, overwhelming. But I will hit some of the key points of what we found. Looking at the lowland rice-based farming system, which is typically labor intensive in terms of transplanting and harvesting, but also labor scarce and in terms of the challenges that farmers face, um, has a strong seasonality uh, and is linked and dependent on, upon markets. We found that there was considerable disruption um, in these systems for seed fertilizers, the supply of agrochemicals, fuel, fuel, feed, and in the case of aquacultural systems linked to rice production, um, disruptions in fingerling um, uh, supply and disruptions in the um, ability of farmers to receive credit during the first wave of the pandemic. Produce and marketing channels were also marginally disrupted. And we, ex we saw that across the region, there was a implication of a limited to moderate influx of returning laborers that would normally work in these, uh, uh, these systems um, for, um, to cities and, inter and in, in terms of international migration, um, which did have an effect on the ability of farmers to produce rice during the first wave of the pandemic last year as it swept across the region. These effects, however, were somewhat um, moderated by um, interventions in, in the food system and in the farming system with a number of countries that adopted COVID-19 policies supporting agriculture in particular with the importance of rice production, uh, including uh, enhanced minimum, minimum support price policies, um, uh, purchase of, um, of grain from farmers at a larger scale to enhance national food grain stocks and social production programs and credit provision. Next slide. Next, moving on to the irrigated wheat-based farming systems of the region. Um, what we found is that the irrigated wheat-based systems um, suffered considerably from movement restrictions that occurred uh, particularly during March and April of 2020. And this had a strong effect on household income. Um, and you'll see, you know, on each slide, I'm showing a range of different indicators that we looked at for each of these systems, but I'm, I'm highlighting some of the key points. And this was important because when the first wave struck the region, much of the wheat that is grown within the region was near harvest or needed to be then marketed shortly thereafter. So it had a significant impact and, and challenge that we, uh, we documented in this work. Um, these systems also were associated with the production of perishables as additional commodities, namely milk vet and vegetables, which were similarly disrupted in the early stages of the pandemic, um, whereas the specific uh, outcome of food grain marketing was somewhat limited, but we did see challenges occurring with respect to the harvesting of the wheat crop. Um, we saw, however, a number of policies that were put into place in different countries to support wheat in particular, and these included welfare support and poverty alleviation policies that were adopted rapidly in response to the COVID crisis, in particular in China, India, Pakistan, and Uzbekistan. Next slide, please. Looking at the dryland mixed farming and food system, um, what we saw was that there was, again, also uh, an imp impact in terms of um, a lack of transport and market restrictions, labor shortages, inadequate supply of quality inputs, and the opportunistic behavior of intermediaries, uh, particularly uh, middlemen at the farm gate seeking higher margins within the system because of the crisis. Um, due to restrictions on international trade in particular. Um, 
In contrast, we did not see a large effect in terms of harvest and post-harvest activities for a variety of the commodities that are produced by this system. What we did see, however, was that maize marketing in the dryland mixed farming system appears to have been particularly affected in some countries by the collapse in um, poultry feed um, and, and demand for poultry feed. And that occurred in particular um, because of the early, during the early wave of the pandemic, there was a lack of understanding around what, what the risks of food consumption were. And in many cases in countries, for example, in India, and this was also documented to another extent in partially in Southeast Asia, but not in the dryland mix system, that there were border closures and or a reduction in poultry consumption that then impacted the maize production systems um, within the region. Next slide. Lastly, looking at the hill mixed farming system, again, that spans much of the, the Himalayan hills and moves into Southeast Asia. Um, this was a very interesting system to look at. Um, we found that initial relief programs that were offered by governments and went into these areas were moderately effective in supporting um, recovery and assuring that there could be planting, harvesting, and marketing services, input distribution, and social protection programs. Um, however, uh, in the these cases, the hill mixed farming system, typically being a lower input system, um, did not suffer as dramatically as we saw in the other systems, which were more intensive, because input levels are low, with some exceptions. The hill system, however, um, did experience a major waste of perishables and vegetable in the terms of vegetables and spices, notably losses of ginger and turmeric, which are widely po uh, grown, particularly in the Himalayas. Um, and this occurred during, due to restrictions on movement and marketing during the early stages of the, the pandemic. Next slide. So now trying to pull some of these lessons together, and again, this is very complicated given the complexities of the things that we are looking at in the broad regions where we tried to capture information on the effects of the first wave. Um, we find that basically the, the, the primary effect of COVID-19 on the region's farming systems during the first wave resulted from restrictions and movement, which affected input and output value chains in particular and also had a strong seasonal effect, as I mentioned, um, with respect to the um, irrigated wheat-based systems um, and the fact that met much of the wheat crop was a, to be harvested around this time and or marketed during this time. However, many national governments also declared food and agriculture to be essential services, which we've also seen in second and third waves of COVID. And this has helped to some extent to uh, buffer against the initial disruptions of the, the first wave of the pandemic um, as it moved across the region. The effects on perishable distribution um, chains were most severe, however, in the hill mixed systems that we saw, um, primarily because of their distance to overall markets that would receive perishables and were relatively medium across the other farming systems in comparison. Um, and finally, local market disruptions were quite severe in the irrigated wheat-based systems, um, relatively common in the lowland rice and, and dry, um, dryland mix systems, but, um, but less so in the hill market systems. So you saw an effect where these more isolated systems in the hills had functional localized markets, but were significantly cut off from their broader value chains and the ability to market more widely, which we saw as an, having implications for the potential for the localization um, of markets in the future. And that has been something that's come out in a lot of the literature following the crisis um, is the need to shorten value chains and build resilience. Next slide. So we also looked a little bit the, at the effects of, on labor, which I've discussed to some extent already, but also on the, the, the effects of um, the, the first wave on gender. And you see this compared in this radar chart here. Um, 
essentially when it comes to labor, we found that the, the, the hill mix system was the least affected, again, because this is a less intensive system. And because of the seasonality of the first wave, the irrigated wheat-based system was the most effective, affected um, with strong implications also in the lowland rice-based systems. In terms of gender, we saw that the strongest effect was exhibited with respect to harvesting and post-harvest activities in the irrigated wheat-based system. And that, again, is a bit of a, I wouldn't say artifact, but is a direct effect of the timing in which the first wave struck within the region. Um, in particular, we saw issues where wheat farmers in India and laborers in India experienced very severe effects in terms of the loss of labor. Um, much of that was covered in the media last year, if you recall. And we also registered severe effects that occurred in Kazakhstan and Tajikistan as well. Looking forward, we also tried to understand, you can go ahead to the next slide, ML. Um, what what the overall implications might be in terms of the resilience of these of the systems looking at um, a, an indexed score that we put together um, around uh, productivity, economics, uh, economic performance, the maintenance of natural resources, food security and social capital, and trying to understand how that might affect the longer term sustainability of these farming systems considering these kinds of um, shocks as we saw resulting from, from COVID. And um, what we found in general is that the systems were quite similar, but again, that we saw a stronger resilience in the hill mixed farming system um, in comparison to the more intensified systems. But again, these are less productive systems and more cut off systems. To try to summarize, and ML will go into more detail on the next few slides, what we found is that um, public policies and programs that ensured that, that assured that staples were more available to segments of the population that needed them and so on were typically beneficial. The uh, disruption to milk and vegetable markets were were severe in many of the systems and very problematic. And this suggests that with the data that many consumers focused on maintaining dietary energy rather than being able to purchase products during the first wave that had nutritional valuable, uh, value. Another consequences of the disruption in labor markets was the loss of on-farm, or sorry, excuse me, off-farm work, which is very important in all of these systems and the fact that we very often see remittances coming from off farm to support farming systems. And there was a loss in those remittances, which also undermined farmers ability to respond effectively to the crisis. We make a few points around policy considerations that might be important in the future um, at the end of the paper. And these include seizing opportunities for employment in agriculture, but through engagement in mechanization services, which can be used to make sure that farming systems can function while still maintaining social distancing. We suggest taking full advantage of the knowledge economy and ICTs to assist in marketing and market distribution um, when there are social distancing and lockdown policies in place. In some of the systems and countries we saw, some structural adjustment programs might be needed to improve equitable development and assure that there are not significant gendered impacts when crises such as COVID strike. And then finally, um, what we saw was that there is evidence for the potential importance of um, shortening value chains and localizing um, farming systems. But last but not least, and this is a key thing that came out in many studies, is that there really needs to be um, data sets and information that allow us to be able to understand what the implications are of, of shocks like this. If you want to measure resilience in systems, you need to be measuring and having panel data on a regular basis. So once a shock occurs, you can measure the speed at which you return back to normal or into a different state. And in many cases, the amount of data that is available is, is not too, too, too wide. And we were surprised how difficult it was to find information. And thankfully, more work is being pushed forward in that direction. And we have colleagues on the call. I see my colleague Amjad Bamboo is on the call in Bangladesh, 
for example, where we've been engaging with, with uh, FAO and partners around trying to make sure that we have better metrics for food systems so we can measure the speed of resilience and guide the rebound through resilience back after shocks such as this occur in the future. For the rest of the story, you'll have to read the paper, which will be coming out any day now. Back to you, ML. Uh, thanks, Tim. So, uh, you know, in continuation of what uh, the, the broader level study uh, results, what Tim shared, uh, we did some uh, micro level and more focused uh, in, in India. And, uh, you know, when we talk about COVID and air pollution, you have been, you know, hearing those stories. And if I cite the examples in, in 2019, about 1.67 million deaths were attributed to air pollution in India, which accounts for nearly 18% of the total deaths in the country. So that's the magnitude of the challenge, uh, you know, air pollution, and that's uh, making, you know, the, under the COVID situation, making more complicated things. And uh, also the, the lost output from the premature deaths and, and morbidity attributable to the air pollution that accounted an economic loss of uh, nearly you know, $37 billion in you know, 2019 in India. So that's again, a huge uh, you know, issue. And uh, this loss is equal to 1.36% you know, of the India's GDP. So you can, you can see you know, the challenge of, because of the air pollution and that has to do a lot uh, you know, related to agriculture and, and COVID. And this was published uh, by Pandey and colleagues in Lancet uh, Planetary Health. And based on this uh, publication, we responded back uh, in this uh, you know, Lancet uh, Planetary Health uh, journal published uh, just in April, 2021, and suggested uh, you know, some policy you know, aspects and key strategies, how to mitigate agriculture's contribution to the air pollution in India. So because of the paucity of time, I'm not putting everything together. But I think there are strategies, uh, you know, through our work on sustainable intensification, and some of those things can be addressed. Also, uh, you know, a, a team of a uh, whole range of people across the centers and the national systems, and this was led by, uh, you know, our colleague, uh, you know, Andy McDonald, you know, Balvinder is part of it, John Helen, Peter, you know, and Bruno, and uh, you know, Balvinder and everyone, and Dr. Chidu. And uh, we, we put together this, uh, the, the challenge, you know, and documented this in the World Development Journal. And, uh, you know, concluded that uh, the in tissue link between the chronic health conditions associated with the air pollution and the vulnerability of the individuals and communities to the COVID-19. And also the, the poor air quality, you know, imposes high uh, significant public health burden in, in Northwest India because of uh, the crop residue burning you know, especially during you know the peak winters, uh, that needs uh, you know a lot of uh, you know policy changes uh, to promote uh, the technology, the practice practices which uh, helps in reducing that uh, you know the pollution. So that that was another study. There was another systematic study uh, you know on COVID impacts uh, in in northwest India. The study led by Balvinder and the other colleagues, uh, Paris, uh, you know, and we were involved, including. And Bruno and many people from ICER, and we made different scenarios. Uh, what will happen if uh, there is no labor availability on the on the transplanting of the rice, and if transplanting is delayed, then what will happen? You know, on the on the on the, uh, the window for planting of wheat and for field preparation, and that uh, burning peak will shift towards more of winter, and that may make things more complicated in terms of the COVID infection. So, so that's that the gist of the paper. But uh, in terms of, uh, you know, you can see, you know, under those different scenarios, uh, you know, losses in the productivity and also in, in terms of the economics uh, to the farmers. And we did uh, at the district level analysis. And uh, we, we came up uh, with, with a figure of uh, that uh, if there is no action, uh, there is no, you know, policy initiatives, uh, there will be a loss of 13 to 35 percent in in the productivity of the rice wheat system in this uh, heartland of the green revolution and that may lead to an economic loss of uh, 1.5 billion dollars and i think uh, you know uh, you know and, and this was documented in in in, in this paper and what uh, the advice we made was uh, moving towards uh, the direct seeding of rice to cope up uh, with some of those labor issues moving towards more of mechanized planting of the rice 
using shorter duration rice varieties and some diversification and of course uh, using uh, you know planters like happy cedar for planting of the wheat to uh, cope up with the shorter window and i think uh, you know this was one of the the aspect where i think government did very well and uh, you know could save those losses and and reduce uh, you know the pollution issues uh, because of their faster action we also run a, a survey to to uh, you know to 1600 plus farmers in in haryana and punjab um, you know documenting the covid impacts and you can see uh, 90% farmers reported uh, labor shortage issues in punjab or 100% farmers reported labor shortage issues in haryana and then you can see the market access problem the seed shortage problem the fertilizer shortage problem all those problems because of of course that varies within i mean the adjoining states but some states uh, you know did well and others uh, you know haven't done that well but i think th those were the challenges also uh, you know to to respond this and as i said uh, you know uh, advising go for direct seeding rice so you know there was uh, because of the labor we have been advising direct seeded rice but under this uh, pandemic the cost of transplanting further increased to 1200 rupees so that moved to 4000 rupees i think so promoting that direct seeded rice under that scenario is further advantageous in 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 addition to uh, saving on cost saving on water and also improving on 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 the soil health and reducing environmental footprints and uh, and, and 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 but but uh, at the same time you know there was a uh, lot of um, uh, you know apprehensions of the farmers but we we try to capture the response of the farmers on the direct seeded rice last season and you can see in both the states in the overall rating you know the excellent to good uh, you know response was very high ranging uh, from uh, nearly 80% farmers were happy uh, in punjab and and uh, you know nearly 90% farmers were happy in haryana and this difference was basically attributed to selection of the varieties because farmers were not equipped they were not informed what variety do well under direct seeding and what doesn't so they use similar set of uh, crop varieties i mean rice varieties for direct seeding and transplanting so some of the varieties uh, they they really don't do well in in direct seeding and that's why you know some of the farmers face problem but i think this is this kind of insight uh, you know helps in further developing the strategies and uh, you know the as i said the government is very proactive they have taken very intelligent and progressive action and this season this season they have they have rescheduled the power supply to move for direct seeded rice and punjab government plant 1 million hectare of uh, area under direct seeded rice which was uh, nearly 20 30000 hectare in 2019 and last year they reported 600000 hectare and this year's plan is uh you know 1 million hectare i think that's how the the crisis uh, you know helps in promoting uh, the, the the technologies and I, i think there is a realization at the national level on on these uh, these aspects and recently you know end of last week there was a national seminar led by icar where nearly 2000 stakeholders gathered together from all sectors including the the the, the senior policy level people and the leadership of the icar and deliberated how to move forward on on direct seeded rice taking the advantage of this covid kind of scenario and which is uh, coming up with a policy uh, road map on on this and uh, you know we were we were involved and contributed to this but at the same time we are also you know making dialogues with the governments and 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 engaging with them you know it's uh, you know taking those advantages and and realization why can't we move towards uh, you know carbon market for regenerative agriculture and we recently had uh, you know series of meetings and discussions with the punjab government and they showed uh, uh, interest to move forward around uh, you know the carbon credits and ecosystem services which could be a win win because we showed the potential to to them and uh, you know finally my you know last couple of slides uh, i think uh, what we need to do is uh, doing business unusual within uh, usual business settings and uh, for that uh, we we need to understand the challenge at appropriate time and then explore windows of opportunity what we have been doing and in those windows of opportunity we have to zoom our focus uh, you know at times and uh, we really need not to reinvent the wheel i mean for and i cited the examples those uh, technologies were there but i think targeting them appropriately at appropriate time was something very important so we can capitalize uh, 
on the opportunities out of those challenges. There are always opportunities out of the challenges. And uh, then we can demonstrate uh, with clarity of the objectives. And I think then analyze, analyzing the things and reanalyzing you know, as what is critical for the farmer, what is critical for the society, what is critical for the government and what is critical for industry individually or in tandem is something very, very important. But, uh, you know, I would say that generalization is dangerous, so we should not generalize. We should be very specific on those aspects. And based on, you know, all those papers, I'll, uh, I have, you know, some of the, the take home or key messages. So as team already, you know, you know, described all those things, but still to sum up, uh, uh, you know, uh, the presentation, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has generated major social and economic crisis. Uh, exploiting institutional, social, and economic vulnerabilities and aggravating the existing food insecurity and poverty. Uh, the principal Asian food and farming systems were moderately resilient to COVID-19, reinforced by the, by the government policies as, as, as team indicated in many countries that prioritize uh, the food availability and affordability, the, the fast uh, you know, policy actions. Um, the rural livelihoods and food security were affected primarily because of the disruptions of the local labor markets, the farm produce markets, and the input supply chains. And the, the overall uh, the effect on the system performance were more severe in the wheat-based systems and least severe in the hill mixed farming system because of their inbuilt resilience, because of their inbuilt diversity and other things. So that, that, that's, uh, you know, and, and, and these are the, you know, final two more uh, messages. So uh, farming and food systems resilience and sustainability are critical considerations for, for recovery policies and programs, especially in relation to the economic performance that initially recovered from more slowly um, than productivity, natural resource status, and the social capital. And the contractions of the economies and the disruptions of the labor markets, especially for the lowest skilled workers, including farm families, could readily contribute to increased poverty and undermine progress to realize the sustainable development goals. So I think that last uh, you know, bullet is something very, very important that lead to uh, some destructions uh, towards our you know, global um, you know, agenda. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. M. 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 L. Yad. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we have time for questions uh, for the question uh, session. Um, Dr. Prasanna, you have written some uh, comments and questions in your in this chat box. Would you like to make them uh, with your micro open, or or should I read them? Yeah, uh, just a very quick question. Thanks a lot, both uh, of you. Uh, ML and Tim for this uh, very useful analysis, uh, which has serious implications, uh, especially in terms of the coping strategies uh, that countries like uh, South Asian countries have to do. Um, a few very quick questions. Uh, there is a fleeting statement about uh, the poultry industry hit by COVID. Uh, do we have an exact understanding of how deeply uh, the poultry industry was hit, what are the economic implications of this in the context that uh, maize is driving the poultry industry uh, in Asia. And it is one of the biggest drivers that is leading to a, an annual, a cumulative annual growth rate of more than 6% for maize consistently over the last uh, few years. What's your take on this? How? Do, do you have reliable figures on this? It's an excellent question, Prasanna, and the answer is no. Um, and that, that actually does need to be a separate but related piece of research that focuses specifically on that work. I, I would imagine that the trade industry associations probably have some of this information, but we, in the context of this work, did not um, attempt to quantify that that impact economically again because we were focused on the farming systems and and broad geographies um, anecdotally though um, what we we do know is that there was that first reduction in meat consumption that i believe has been documented in literature 
And there were a lot of issues in Southeast Asia, particularly um, as we know, for example, that Thailand um, and, and Laos, Vietnam, for example, um, produce a fair amount of maize. Well, that either produce and consume a fair amount of maize for poultry. So a fair amount of what's produced in Thailand, for example, may move over um, to Vietnam or is brought up into China. The same with, with the north of Myanmar and so on. And border closures that occurred at that time um, did disrupt the ability to move maize to their, their ultimate um, end destination markets, which would, would have meant going to, to the poultry industry um, in those countries. So it's a compelling piece of really important work. If we had another year of the CRPs, I would strongly argue that we should find a way to document this. Um, <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, because I think it's, it's, it's a very important thing, but, but not one that's easily looked at and does require really sitting down and digging into trade yeah. documents. And, but one, so indirect, on. uh, one indirect evidence of this hit is uh, the fall of maize prices. Uh, in and I believe many many companies are also badly hit uh, because yeah. the farmers are finding not so remunerative prices, uh, especially over the last two years. Uh, so there is uh, indirect evidence, but I would like to see some more solid analysis of this. Secondly, in your figure of those five criteria, uh, I see that many of the systems have almost equal effect except in some columns, uh, one or two are going up and down the bars. Uh, that I find to be uh, very surprising rather. Um, I would expect different levels of uh, effect on different farming systems, uh, but not equal with regard to productivity or uh, other factors. So any comments on that? Uh, it, yeah, it, it, that again was a bit of a surprise in, in particular that, that result. Um, and I, I think to some extent the reason why that occurs and why this was difficult to measure, um, again, looking at the first wave, was that there's a strong seasonal effect of what's being produced by those systems. Um, and that came out, I think, in, in some of what we saw. Um, although we did see a trend again of the, the hill farming systems being less intensively cultivated and less well, um, market integrated, um, being somewhat less hit than others. Um, some of this also occurs because of the use of the, the Likert scales and the way in which you calculate um, from the Likert scales on, on whole number basis that means that you don't um, get the degree of resolution in the data that you might get otherwise. Um, but when trying to administer something um, like the instrument that we utilized for the study to a diversity of respondents, including everything from sort of farmer group leaders all the way up to, to policymakers, um, we went for a very simple and I think at times a little unfortunately blunt research instrument to collect that information. So that's, that's perhaps why some of those numbers bore out that way. I do think perhaps more informative is um, is when is is actually reading in the documentation that one finds in the text of the paper and the supplementary materials, which are are rich and full of a lot of information from different countries, that that unpacks that story in a bit more detail. It's difficult, however, when you aggregate all of that information from you know this large global region using a relatively um, necessary but blunt research instrument to see those differences borne out quantitatively, but you see it very much in the qualitative information that was collected and associated with the, the quantitative data from the Likert scales. Thanks, Tim and uh, Emma. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have another question in, a, in the chat box. Um, Okay, uh, from Victor Comorel. Um, any findings from similar CG and no CG studies that you could compare your findings with similarities and differences, especially with regard to labor market uh, dynamics and consequences from family um, or any consequences for family income? 
Well, I'll do a, a first answer on that, which is, I think, yes. And, and an example, for example, is some of the work that um, we did in Bangladesh. And I want to, again, acknowledge um, my colleague Amjad Babu, who's on the call. Um, we worked, for example, last year with FAO and put a lot of data into a, a study that was um, published by FAO on the implications of the first wave um, in Bangladesh with a lot of detail looking at, at labor dynamics, the implications for um, farm services and um, in, input provision and so on. And there, you, you can see a little bit of those effects as a microsm of what we saw at, at a larger scale. Um, and since you know that publication came out last year, um, along with a whole range of others, so the literature has really exploded on this topic very, very quickly. Um, and you do see similarities that have that have occurred across the, the, the papers that have been put out. I think the, the difference again is that um, we, we took on the challenge of really trying to examine it in a semi quantitative way for a very large uh, portion of the globe and try to package some of that information and summarize it, which is, is much easier said than done um, when you get the data back and the information back. The group of authors that we had, we had some very rich discussions and quite a lot of debate around what, what the data meant um, and then how to represent that. Um, but I think it will be a unique contribution because of the, um, the ambition and size of the, the, the area and the system studied. Uh, ML, you probably have more to add yeah. based uh, on that. Yeah, so there are, there are a lot of uh, studies, for example, this agricultural systems uh, Broad the special issue around the COVID, where like we did, uh, you know, the across Asia, but there are country level and sub national level studies uh, on the similar aspects, uh, you know, conducted by some of the national institutions and the other collaborators. So, uh, you know, there is information available, but uh, as Tim, you have indicated, like if you go with the micro level, like our own studies in Northwest India, you know, focusing just there, and versus, you know, if you compare with the Asia level study, I mean, you may not see, you know, similar kind of trends because there are more specifics around, uh, but uh, there are a lot of, lot of uh, such studies available, Victor. Thank you so much. Um, there is one more comment here. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> in Nepal, it was found that business were more affected due to COVID-19 than agriculture production in 2020. If COVID-19 becomes an annual phenomenon, what are the learnings? Can agriculture provide additional jobs and livelihoods if rural enterprises close? What can be the solutions? I, I almost want to ask Dutiman who posed that question to also give his thoughts on the answer because I think it's a very, it's a very important question. Um, and I think it depends to some extent on the systems in which you're looking at and the, the, the country contexts. Um, I think what's important is going to be looking at the adaptation of these systems through the second and third waves that have, have occurred. Remember what we showed you was a, a study of a very large area that was conducted at the end of last year, focused primarily on the, the first wave. But since then, South Asia has been through it, and in some countries like Nepal is still going through or coming down off of its second wave, uh, while many of us still have a concern about a third wave um, coming into place. So I think that there, there are significant implications that, that need to be considered. And I think Dutiman, if the, the, the direction you seem to be pointing in, and I think is the correct one, is that there is definitely a strong effect on, on farming and food production systems, but it's really um, in the systems like the, the irrigated, the wheat, the lowland rice-based systems that we saw, for example, that are really very strongly market integrated. The, the, the bigger impact comes in the form of agribusiness and the implications for agribusiness and the people who are um, employed by agribusinesses. And so um, there's a lot of different literature and thoughts upon how to adjust policy to respond to those issues, how to support with social services or um, for example, loans to bring businesses back from, um, from the impacts of, of the, the second and third wave, 
um, financial support mechanisms for businesses and otherwise um, that I think definitely do need to be considered because um, we can't continue to th think about agricultural systems in isolation as production systems. We really do need to be thinking about um, across the value chain, especially when it comes to these very large scale um, shocks that are, it's a health-based crisis, but it really otherwise is an economic shock in and of itself. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, well, it's uh, almost, uh, we have, uh, we are almost uh, done. So I don't know whether you would like to, to give us a message so we can close it when you're this special seminar. Yeah, Isabel, you were asking me because my connection is not uh, fantastic, but uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Dr. Okay. Okay, okay. No, no, thanks a lot to, uh, to Emel and Tim for this, this excellent presentation. I think it summarized very well a series of studies work that are strategic. And, and I liked the background in uh, Tim uh, video, uh, research into impact, because we can clearly see the, you know, the impact pathway and the potential positive impact such studies can, uh, can, can generate in terms of helping uh, governments at the policy level, but also development agencies in terms of better targeting uh, specific interventions, whether institutional ones or, or technical ones. So I think it's, it's, it's very, very important. It makes me think of the work of IFPRI and just take it as a compliment. Uh, <laughs> and I think IFPRI has been involved in some of those studies as well. Um, Something that uh, you mentioned, Tim, that the CRP, uh, you, would, you would use well uh, an additional year of CRP funding for that. We are transforming the, in, in, in 1CG, so we have initiatives right now. And I believe that such a work is very important for, I would, I would see many initiatives that could you know, contribute to that. You mentioned I, I, it, your, the work of the Act Systems paper has sure very very challenging I, most people would have been discouraged looking at the data available the gaps you have both in the temporal dimension and spatial dimension i think the lessons learned from that is probably generate uh, you know a better methodology data collections that we can look at production systems at the regional level in a much more uh, intelligent manner in, in, in the future. So discuss, and I think it would probably be system, although I don't believe in those divisions because we have been walking across those divisions in SIMIT uh, for many, many years. So um, I, I think the lessons learned in those analyses that are imperfect, and I was I had a question about you know methodology for your scoring, because like Prasanna, I, th I thought they were more or less all the same. So what was the, you know, the trend in that? So um, I would, I would uh, invite you and, and, and your group of, of, of scientists just to come with some recommendation in terms of observatories at the regional level for agri-food systems. Mm. Um, again, well, I would like to thank, to thank you very much for, for, for the work, yeah. Yeah, well, just as a, a point, as someone put in a quick comment about the COVID-19 um, hub in the, in, under 1CGIR, and I think it's, it is important to point that out, is I think that some of the um, discussion around the need for obs observational data um, to take stock of the health of food systems is, is being carried forward in, that, in that, that work, which will be, I believe, very helpful in the long run. Yeah, I hope. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that you have been working with FAO as well. I believe that FAO has somehow a, a global mandate for such a type of work, but not always, uh, you know, having the resources to do it alone. So I think that's something that needs to be further discussed. So thanks a lot to everyone for attending, and I'll back to you, Isabel. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, then I would like to appreciate. Uh, uh, Dr. Um, Jad, uh, Principal Scientist, System Agronomist, Dr. Timothy Krampin, System Agronomist and CIMIT's Country Representative in Bangladesh, and, and Dr. Bruno Gerard, who is retired from CIMIT. Uh, our best wishes to your new neighbor and neighbors. And thank you very much uh, for all the audience. And uh, you are invited for the coming series, uh, regional series of se uh, seminars that will be presented. Thank you very much and have an a beautiful uh, weekend. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you so much.